on the other hand, those detailed dynamical systems models, those mathematical models, uh, do provide, do offer predictive power, but they do require bespoke construction. Each one is different in its own way. They're, they're often difficult to parameterize. They need a lot of parameters, which are often difficult to measure. And they rapidly become complex and unwieldy as, as you add more and more components. And neither of these views really matches the elegance, the, the intuitive simplicity implied by the, the Waddington landscape metaphor. So how do we get to that? So what we'd really like is a, a data-driven quantitative method, methods that capture the idea that development involves cells transitioning through discrete step-like changes to produce divergent sequences of, of cell states. So that's what we set out to do with David Brown, Mary, uh, Elena, and others. So we wanted to establish a set of experimental and theoretical methods that could offer mechanistic and, and predictive models of cell fate decisions. Um, in this view, in this idea that it's represented by discrete switches in, in cell states. So to do this, we've, we've taken advantage of dynamical systems theory. So I don't want to get into a lot of detail about the theory today, which David Rand and Mary and colleagues have, have worked up in, in great detail. But I just have to remind you of, of some, some basics um, so that we're all on the, the same page. So graphically, we can also represent um, dynamical systems in, in a landscape view. But now instead of sort of a mountainous landscape, you have to imagine uh, a landscape, uh, like a cratered lunar-like landscape, where uh, cell types are represented by these craters, these basins, rather than valleys. Um, and I'm going to refer to those basins as probably as attractors. And still, you can imagine a ball rolling through this type of landscape. and a ball will roll to the bottom of an attractor, to the bottom of, of a crater. So if you think of this type of landscape, or indeed of an, any landscape, we can depict a, a three-dimensional topology in two dimensions using contour lines. So the contour lines represent points of equal height um, in, in that landscape. And I want to particularly point out to you the, um, the green dots in, in this representation. So these green dots represent what are called saddle nodes. And that is the lowest point between two attractors, between two bas basins of attraction. So if you, think, if you think about the landscape metaphor, they're the mountain passes, the lowest points um, to, from crossing from one basin to another. And they're found wherever those contour lines of equal height where they, they cross. So if we have this contour line description of a landscape, we can represent that mathematically with equations. And what those equations do, they translate every point in two dimensions into a uh, height. So you go from x, y point in, in two dimensions to a third value, z, z, which is the height uh, of, of that. Now, if we have such a function, we can differentiate that. And what that differentiation function, function then gives us <coughs> is the gradient, the slope at every point in, in the landscape. And so that differentiated function, that gradient function, now describes how a ball rolling in that landscape, how that will move, how that will move. So we've gone from uh, a metaphor of a landscape to a set of mathematical equations of dynamical landscape, which tells us mathematically, in quantitative detail, how uh, a ball will roll in the landscape. So those, those equations are often referred to as potential functions. Um, and they can take any form you like it. I've got an example of one on the slide here. And any function depends on parameters. So if we make some of those parameters within a potential function adjustable, then adjusting that parameter will change, will result in a change in the landscape. And we can think about those adjustable parameters as representing the signals, the morphogens, within the developing signal. And see, so in this particular example, you can see how changing a particular parameter here labeled as A um, results in the, the landscape changing. You can see this basin of attraction decreasing in size until it disappears. And therefore, any cells which were in this basin will be tipped out and roll into 
the adjacent basins. So that process of the disappearance of a basin of attraction is, is called a bifurcation. And bifurcations happen when those green dots, those saddle nodes, um, hit or merge with the bottom, the red dots, which represent the bottom of the attractors. Now, there's a whole branch of mathematics which was pi pioneered in the 1960s by Rennie Tom called catastrophe theory. And catastrophe theory provides a very powerful classification scheme, so archetypes of landscapes. And um, I'll come back and mention that again, but we've relied on that for developing further this approach. Okay, so that's, that's the theory over, that's the introduction over. So what I want to um, outline now is what we set out to do. So we wanted to take a, a specific developmental system where we could generate experimental data, quantify different cell types, and the influence of how signals affect um, the cell types which are generated, and then construct the relevant uh, landscape and map out how the signals affect the landscape and therefore how they generate those different cell types. So the first thing we had to do was to choose a, a biological system. And the system we chose was a differentiation of embryonic stem cells. Okay, so you don't need to, to, to know the details, but just in, in case you're interested, we were looking at how um, embryonic stem cells, how they differentiate in response to two signals, so wind signaling and, and uh, FGF signaling. And you can see in the absence of any signals, initially ES cells become an epiblast-like cell identity, in the absence of further signaling over a period of four or five days, they become brain-like tissue, so anterior neural tissue. If those epiglass cells are exposed to wind and FGF signaling, they take on a caudal identity, very much like the uh, cells that Denis really introduced you to this morning where the Hox uh, clock is, is ticking. They're called caudal epiglass cells. Then, uh, in the absence of further signal, they will become posterior neurosis, so spinal cord-like cells. But if those epiblast cells uh, continue to be exposed to wind signaling, they will adopt a mesoderm-like uh, identity. So the reason we chose this system is we have molecular markers which allow us to distinguish each of these cell types uh, just by uh, gene expression. And we can manipulate the system by manipulating when and how much wind and FGF signaling uh, we provide to these cells so the experimental setup is the following. So we uh, treat differentiating ES cells with timed uh, exposure to a wind tag, and so Chiron for those that know about it, FGF ligand or an inhibitor of FGF signaling here labeled uh, PD. And then we simultaneously measure the expression of multiple markers in single cells using flow cytometry. And that allows us, that gives us a proportion of cell types um, at each time point in, in each, each condition. So I emphasize that we've used flow cytometry here but to, to assay cell identity, but any, any assays that allow cell fate assignment at a single cell resolution, so single cell transcriptomics, for example, would, would work. So in total, we build the model I'm going to describe from data from seven treatment regimes measured at seven time points. It's a total of about 300 measurements. And we kept separate a, a distinct set of about, um, I think, 150 measurements, which weren't used in the, the data fitting and were important, were, which we then used to validate the model we built. Okay, so now we have experimental data. So we've allocated um, each cell at each time point in our, in our experimental data set to a cell identity, and we can see the proportions of cell types which arise in, in, in each of um, these conditions. So now the next challenge is to represent these data in a dynamical landscape. So if you look at this cartoon of differentiation, I think it's evident that uh, you can see there are the two binary decisions here. So there's a first decision where an epiblast cell has to decide whether to become anterior neural or caudal. And then a second decision where this caudal epiblast has to decide whether to become posterior neural or mesoderm. So there's two um, binary decisions here. And we hypothesize that the global landscape 
uh, would consist of, of two three attractor landscapes, each corresponding to one of those binary uh, decisions. So this is where catastrophe theory really helped us out. So it turns out that there are only two ways uh, in which you can build three attractor landscapes. So the first, uh, uh, the first way you to do it at the top there is have three attractors, A, B, and C, uh, uh, separated by two, two saddle nodes with one attractor in the middle. So effectively, the attractors are in a line. And we call this the, the binary choice landscape. So changing levels of signal causes the bifurcation of uh, one or the other uh, attractor, and then cells in that middle attractor will fall into one or the other, depending on uh, which saddle node causes the bifurcation. So the second landscape here at the bottom is now slightly more uh, uh, flexible allocation of, of cell identity, and we call this a binary flip landscape. So in this case, cells start off in the attractor A, and there's a saddle node separating it from the other two attractors. And depending on how this, uh, what's called the unstable manifold, the escape route from this saddle node, depending on whether that connects the A attractor to B or to C, um, will uh, alter how cells exiting the A attractor, what cell identity, what uh, attractor they will uh, adopt. And you can see there's another saddle node, again a second saddle node, separating B from C within the uh, second basin. Okay, and these are the only two ways, so catastrophe theory indicates these are the only two topological arrangements one can have of three attractors. So with that in mind, and I won't go through the details today, but just by inspection of the data, it indicated that the first decision from epiblast to anterior neural caudal epiblast um, is best represented uh, as an all or nothing transition, so consistent with a, a binary choice landscape. By contrast, that second decision, the cells leaving the caudal epiblast attractor to either become mesodermal posterior neural, they're allocated in different proportions to the two plates, and that's best described by the, the binary flip landscape. So now topologically we've got these two landscapes and we can glue them together by that shared caudal epiblast um, uh, attractor. So this has allows us to construct a, a complete model. And to do that again we took advantage of catastrophe theory in the normal forms, the, the archetypes of those, uh, of those landscapes. So now we've got a mathematical model where we describe this landscape but we need the parameters to, to um, complete that mathematical model. So to uh, generate the parameters, to, to estimate the parameters, we took advantage of uh, a machine learning approach, so optimization using approximate Bayesian computation. And this allowed us to estimate the approximate 20 parameters of the model from the experimental data. So what we do is we simulate time series for a population of cells in the landscape using the flow defined by the equations. And um, it's a stochastic dynamical system, so that you also fit the noise to this. And then at the end of those simulations, we compare the proportions of cells allocated to each of those attractors with the experimental data. And we run it several billion times using different parameterizations, and there's some other um, nice trickery in there as well. And that allows us to estimate the parameters that best fit the experimental data. So what we're doing is we're just using the proportions of cell types to identify the, um, the, the parameters of the model. And once we've done that, we can we use the experimental data to do that, and we can test whether those um, are reasonable parameters by looking at whether the held back data uh, is also well predicted by, um, by the model we've fitted. And as you can see by the comparison between simulations and experiments here, just indicated in these bar graphs, we end up with a reasonable parameterized model. So a model that gives us reasonably good quantitative predictions of cell types throughout this five-day period to various um, uh, experimental conditions. So we have a dynamical landscape. We've got a quantitative model. So what is that good for? 
So one thing we can do is to view this model as a map of signals to landscape. So it shows how signals change the landscape and how these changes enable cells to transition from one cell fate to a, another cell fate. And there are two types of transitions here. So uh, one is a, a bifurcation of a tractor. So if you look here, uh, in, the absence, in the presence of uh, uh, FGF, uh, this blue attractor here represents a starting epiglass attractor. If you remove FGF, this attractor bifurcates and it results in all of the cells uh, falling into this green attractor here, which is the anterior neural identity. The other way that cells can change is by changing the escape route. So in the absence of wind signaling, so no, no chiron, you can see this escape route connects to the purple posterior neural attractor. In the presence of chiron, this escape route changes and connects to the blue mesoderm attractor. So there's two ways you can, uh, cells can, or signals change the landscape. But more than just sort of explaining, understanding how signals uh, affect cell fate decisions, the model also makes quantitative predictions. So it predicts the proportions of cells we should get from particular signaling regimes. So a simple example of this is um, a quantitative prediction exploring how the level of wind signaling controls the proportions of cells allocated to posterior neural or mesoderm identity. So simply by assuming a, a, uh, a, a particular uh, change, simply assuming that change in wind signaling affects um, uh, the, 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 the levels of signaling, the landscape predicts that how the trajectory flips from, gradually flips from one uh, uh, attractor to the other attractor and makes quantitative predictions about the proportions of cell types we expect to get. And then performing experiments resulted in, again, a reasonably good uh, uh, correspondence to the uh, computational predictions. So it's nice that we've got a way of making quantitative predictions. And I, and I think a more interesting example of this is, is, is exemplified here if we look at um, the relationship between the epiglast cell fate and the caudal uh, epiglast uh, identity. So in our training data set, we found that 24 hours of exposure to wind signaling was enough for the epiglast to bifurcate, so the epiglast cell fate disappeared, and the cells to adopt a caudal epiglast identity. Then if signaling was, uh, or wind signaling was then removed, those uh, caudal epiglast cells become posterior uh, neural. And, and that was uh, in the, uh, the training data set and gave rise to simulations which corresponded to the training data. So, what was more interesting is when we ran simulations, what we found that if wind signaling was shortened to just 12 hours, so to half a day, then it predicted that some cells would reverse uh, and go back um, the way they came. But because the blue attractor had already bifurcated away, instead of becoming an epiblast identity, they would in fact adopt the alternative anterior neural identity. It was the only attractor uh, left to them. So this was not in the, the training data set. So this was a prediction outside of, of uh, how we trained uh, the, uh, the model. But reassuringly, uh, when we actually performed that experiment of exposing cells to only 12 hours of wind signaling, we indeed saw that cells returned to an anterior neural identity, again, with reasonable correspondence to the quantitative predictions made by the model. OK, so first of all, I think this is a nice validation of the model. It's sort of representative of the type of quantitative predictions that depend on a dynamical model. It wouldn't be possible to predict this just with a probabilistic model. You wouldn't predict that cells would adopt this anterior neural identity. And it also suggests a sort of quantitative, um, data-driven definition of what cell commitment is. So a long-standing idea within developmental biology is that cells commit at some point to a particular fate. 
And here we can define that quantitatively as on the basis of how whether cells have crossed the saddle road and what happens if you um, if, if you then change signaling at a particular time point. Okay, so let me summarize, let me wrap up. So I showed you, showed you how we started uh, constructing dynamical landscape models uh, from single cell data to explain um, cell fate decisions. So this allows us to make non-trivial and quantitative predictions about behavior in, in, in these systems and we can perform experiments which test and confirm those predictions. I think it's important to emphasize that this approach is generalizable. So it's broadly applicable as long as you can measure uh, cell fate at single cell resolution. It doesn't, it's agnostic to what type of data that comes from. And I think given the ubiquity of the, that Waddington metaphor, so as I said, it's from everything from developmental biology to stem cell biology and cancer biology, I think this might have um, a broad utility. I also, uh, I think we can think about this as, as one perspective on, on development as well. So I've been talking about cells in sort of a decision space, so developing cells having to make decisions. And I think the goal now is really to sort of connect these different type of decisions. We can also think of cells within tissue space, which re represents the signals they're being exposed to and the changes in those signals over time. And we can also think about cells in gene expression space, those single cell transcriptomic studies where um, individual cells have, are represented by uh, their gene expression. And I think the goal for us is really to try and link cells between these different spaces. So can we uh, identify a cell within a particular location within the tissue over time? How is that represented in gene expression space and how is that represented in, in, this, in decision space? I think perhaps also conceptually interesting is the realization that there are only, fundamentally, there are only two ways in which a binary decision can be made. And each of those different ways, each of those two types of, of binary decision, I think are different, uh, are useful for different purposes. So the uh, binary choice generates an all or none decision-like uh, response. So that's, you know, in developmental biology terms, that's, one can think of that as an inductive event. Whereas the binary flip landscape is flexible and allows the uh, proportioned allocation of cells to downstream uh, fates. And I think that's appropriate for the kind of decisions where progenitor populations produce a balance of cell types. So given that there are only these two uh, ways in which a decision can be made, it'll be interesting to see if we can begin to classify different decisions in different tissues as one or other of these, these landscapes. And finally, since this, um, you know, we're talking about some of the history today, I thought it, I just wanted to mention that there is um, evidence of, 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 there was a correspondence between Randy Tom, the, the archetype of, of uh, the, the architect of catastrophe theory, and Conrad Waddington in the 1960s. And, and this has been described in, in several historical pieces. And I think my understanding is that there really wasn't a meeting of minds between Tom and Waddington. I think much of the time they were talking past each other with Randy Tom becoming increasingly abstract and, and metaphysical. But like all great academics, the, the one engagement they did have was on priority and, and precedence, as you can see, <laughs> this particular point. So hopefully, you know, meetings like this will mean that we can have more substantial engagements. Okay, let me thank again David Rand uh, at Warwick University. It's been a very productive collaboration with him, including Mary Sayers and Elena Camacho, who uh, pushed all of the theory forward with Eric Sidger at Rockefeller University. And all of the data and analysis was uh, done by Robert Blasberg in my lab. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ray. Please. James, thank you so much. Um, could you talk about time in these models? And 
how variable is that as you change these parameters? So, so the, the models are fully dynamical, so if time is, so that's part of what we're fitting is the rate at which these happen. But so, having so built the architecture, can you actually play with that then in silico? Yes, well, we could. Um, we haven't explicitly done that with these models. Um, and it would actually, that would be an interesting thing to do. So, for example, we could take the equivalent data sets across two species and fit them to the same model and ask how those parameters differ. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, actually, it would take me probably a day to understand what you said. But I, I found it very, very clearly expressed. It's taken me five years, so that <laughs> <laughs> No, no, but I, I'm very interested in it. But let me ask a simple question, you know, two. Um, first, how exactly did catastrophe theory help you out? And the second question is uh, the morphogens. We discussed it two years ago, I remember. And uh, I know what they are, growth factors, etc. But how do they come into the play? How do you uh, create your maps of morphogens? How do they come into being? So let me start with the first question. I will probably forgot the second. So, so what catastrophe theory? Did? One of the things that came out of catastrophe theory was um, a set of uh, a small set of equations which described the simplest possible descriptions of the, the landscapes. I showed you in other landscapes as well. So it gives you a, a small set of polynomial equations, which are the archetypes of, of all possible, within assumptions, all possible um, sets of transitions between attractors. So it really narrows down, you know, vastly narrows down the equations that one has to consider. So that was really important. And what David Rand has done has also um, extended some of the dynamical um, systems theory to prove that you can actually represent um, the, the biological, the type of biological systems we're working with as, as a potential functions, so using these polynomial type descriptions. So it's really important to, uh, otherwise you're just dealing with any possible polynomial, so uh, too big a universe to describe. So the second question was about the morphogens. Can you just... No, I, I, I just wonder how they come into the play. I know what they are, so you don't need to explain yeah. that. But how they come into the play and uh, yeah, how they come into being. Yeah, so I think this is... Yeah, I remember your question from last time. So yes. I, I think my answer was that it's, it's turtles all the way down, right? So <laughs> it, it's... You know, some of those first cell phase decisions generate cell types which produce morphogens, which then influence other cells, which then will produce more or different morphogens and so on. So it's a, it's a self-organizing system in that respect. So initial symmetry breaking event will then cascade down. Some of those decisions result in the generation of cell types which produce specific morphogens. And then within the embryo, those happen in particular locations, and then that results in. So that's coming back to this idea of, you know, one can think of a tissue space as representing the map of signals, because those signals are produced by the cells within the embryo. So they are not related to a particular gradient. They are produced by cells. They're produced by cells and then the cells are within tissue, so those cells producing them can, by spreading away from the producing cells, will form gradients. There are many more questions. So yes, it is still not clear to me how do you go from steady state uh, unfoldings to dynamics and how do concentrations of your signals enter the coefficients of the fitted unfoldings? So we're not, there's no steady state assumption here. The model is fully dynamic. So what we're trying to predict, we're trying to fit parameters that give us accurate predictions of proportions of cell types at the time points we've measured them. So do you actually have a slide with equations? Or do Not in this okay. deck, I can show you later. Mm -hmm. And how do concentrations of things like FGF and wind? So they, they are input into the parameters of the, the polynomial. So, so the coefficients of polynomial are functions of uh, yeah, these. Yeah, they're, they're functions of signals, yeah. 
But James, it's, all, it's a beautiful picture, but um, one of the, I guess, uh, downsides of taking the abstract perspective is that you kind of lose touch with the, the molecules. So I was going to ask, is there any way to see in the in the in the in in the normal forms that you have to describe the landscape, is there any vestige that allows you to get back to the to the genes, the regulatory network? Yeah, I, I, that's something we're, we're thinking about and working on at the moment. Like, so again, I think the normal forms sort of uh, so what creates these landscapes, <coughs> what we believe is gene regulatory network. So uh, a much more complex uh, system underlies this landscape. And so what are the relationships between a, a yeah, detailed gene regulation network and the landscape we're drawing here and the simpler uh, normal form in which we can describe this. And is it, so it, is there anything, um, so, so, so is there a, a way of, of cataloging or, or, or looking at a particular gene regulatory network and saying it's going to be a binary split or a binary choice. Right? Or, or, or even very simple examples of actual sort of regulatory network, something we would recognize as a regulatory network, which for instance yeah. would give the binary flip, which yeah. is an unusual. Yes. It, or it's unusual for us to think about whether it's really unusual. No, I agree. It, we haven't thought of it yeah. much before. Uh, okay, yeah. I guess a simpler way, rather than solving it with three attractive landscapes, and we think about two attractive landscapes, a classic kind of yeah. um, dual pretend, then you can you can much more easily think about the relationship between a gene regulatory network and a, a bistable switch landscape. Yeah. Maybe one last question. Yeah. yeah, thank you for the paper. Um, I was wondering what landscape meant, and, and then at, by the end, near toward the end, you were talking about the tissue space and the gene expression space. I take it that those are those are the landscape, and that uh, ultimately you could work this from the other direction because in, in the end the decisions will be made to have so much of one tissue and so much of another tissue, and you could work backwards uh, from that direction. And uh, I guess the advantage of what you're you know, going forward as you're going is you could. You could um, measure the rate of of change, but ultimately the end is really fixed in some way, and that's what um, I'm. I wanted to ask about. You know, yeah. why not just start with the end and go in the other direction? You know how it, uh, the decisions are ultimately going to be made because there's so much of one tissue and so much of another tissue. Exactly. So we know that in the embryo. If we look in vitro using stem cells, that's what we can manipulate is the proportions of different tissue types, different cell types. So a question I want to answer as a developmental biologist is, what is the embryo doing to ensure that you get those proportions? And experimentally, we can begin to examine that by in vitro by changing, understanding how you change the proportions of those cell types. So it's the mechanism. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe I can also ask a question. So what I found very interesting is that the input data right, are basically your experimental conditions, the timing and the concentrations of the yeah. signals that you provide, and the and, and the relative proportion of the cell types that you identify by specific markers, right? Yeah. So it's basically discrete on both sides. Yeah. And then you said that a probabilistic model could not have found these unexpected paths, meaning that this comes from the fact that you constrain your model to a polynomial, right? which yeah. basically gives you automatically this landscape. Yeah. And, and I was wondering, you know, what justifies the choice of polynomial model that would then basically just by choosing that polynomial model enforce this shaping of the landscape, which might or might not exist? So that comes Tom. back to Tom. the answer to Uta and, and catastrophe theory. So catastrophe theory says a very small, so there's only a very small number of potential of landscapes, and those can be described by these canonical normal forms. Okay. So, so that's how if you if you if that's you're a given, given, basically. It's, it's a given. So if you're confident that the decision you're looking at involves three cell types, mm -hmm. then these are the only two ways of arranging those. 
three cell phones. Yeah. But James, your, your, this model assumes that A will be emptied by the amp, right? I mean, A has a special status in that it is a source and it is not a destination. In, in the way I've described it, but uh, that doesn't have to be the case. You could imagine cells starting in C and then asking what manipulations of the landscape would tip cells into B or A. So well, that, that, would would be, a that would have been Ed's question, but, G, but, I, but I think that, that that is a point about the architecture here, which doesn't really come out from these arrow diagrams terribly well. Yeah, so I've really focused on sort of a normal developmental trajectory, yeah. but you can also think of these as reprogramming. So, for example, that commitment experiment I described to you where cells start to go towards caudal epiblasts and then they're returned, but they don't return to their original state, they go up to an anterior neural. That's not a normal, that's not a usual um, developmental trajectory. But this, these type of models can predict those, those behaviors. It's, it's just interesting because so much actual reprogramming does not recapitulate the path through which the cells got to that point. And so that seems to be the exception rather than the rule. In yes. and, and, and those kind of large leaps yeah. across, you know, what yeah. it turns landscape, they're very inefficient. Right. And yeah, I think there's something in but it's e But they're more efficient than going backwards. Yes. So that's the interesting thing. Right. So yeah, if, yeah okay. We, yeah. Let's talk some more. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much again.